Got it. Sorry. <laughs> no problem at all. Um, so, so um, uh, Representative Felipe, you might want to just say that um, we've corrected the problem so that people know there was a little bit that wasn't taped. Yeah, we, we had a, a short discussion with uh, Teachers Retirement Board, mostly relating to IT issues with software and connecting to Core CT through the comptroller. Um, sorry that everybody missed it, but we are now uh, live on YouTube. We had a few technical difficulties this morning. Any other questions from the, from the subcommittee? Or anything you would want to add, uh, Mr. Pettit, as we go forward? Um, you, you, Senator Austin has, has put forth a, a great question. Uh, we would like to get those numbers out to you and, and to benefit our members in any way that we can. Um, again, I just implore you to, to um, take into consideration the impacts of our, our precarious software position. And, um, and definitely, uh, if you have any other questions, please feel free to forward them to us and, and we'll try to get you answers as quickly as possible. Thank you again for the funding for our plans. Um, our teachers do a great service for this state and it's good to be able to provide the benefits that we do for them. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you for joining us. We really appreciate it. Uh, Madam Administrator, is, are the next folks ready? They are in the waiting room yet. Great. We're a little we early. That's we're, 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 we're good early because um, then we can get, uh, we, we can let SDE know that they should be a little early. That's a good idea. <laughs> I think the commissioner would appreciate that. She had a little bit of a long morning. Yep, she did. We've, we've had a long week. We've had a long week, so that's okay. <laughs> Who's Kathy Austin? Mute yourself, please. I'm not, I don't have anything going on here. Oh, no, it's not me. I'll take Rep the blame. Nolan? Come on. I, I have <laughs> nothing going on. I'm doing emails. <laughs> okay. Sorry, I'm Kathy. Trying, I just assumed do, you were doing it. Yeah, I'm trying to do, I'm trying to do two, meetings, two meetings going on. Turn, yeah, yeah, turn off education. You watch the, you watch the fireworks <laughs> enough, so come on. <laughs> you try to start something. Yeah, yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> It was a little something shift. about this week. People just are like they, they just took off the boxing gloves or something. <laughs> yes. Boxing gloves <clears throat> overrated. Hmm. We did we lose OEC? No, they weren't there. No, it's real. It's OEC is scheduled for two forty five. You're right. That's why we're. I I I, I so thought we're going to have a little bit. Of, you're going to have a little bit of a wait. Okay. Do we want to recess for 15 minutes? Sure. Two thirty. No, to two thirty maybe. And tell me, I I don't know that I can get Beth and her and her team on for oh, okay. they're expecting to be here for two forty five. So okay. 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 Yeah. Thank you. All right. So we'll recess for fifteen minutes. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Uh, it's not part of the chef agreement. Heather, we are in recess for about 
15 minutes. I look forward to uh, working with you on these uh, financial issues. And why Senator Summers, we're in a recess right now uh, until 2.45 when we'll be meeting with the Office of Early Childhood. Okay, I'm going to jump back to public health then. Thank you. Okay, you're welcome. Bye. Hey there, I'm going to try, I'm going to mute it.
from people who are uh, majoring in education. Well, I'm, we're on and recess for a couple minutes. Coming out. And also, we, a, a HTPA reduced black representation among new teacher graduates in more selective teacher preparation programs. Uh, not only find enrollment uh, and find a number of teachers in states that Hey, Laura. Laura Stefan. She's not on. I just let her in. She's not here. Oh, she must have left. Okay. Laura. She's still, she's still on, so there she is. Laura. Hey, Laura, Stefan. Hi, hi, sorry. I don't know what's happening with this technology. Please, <laughs> I'm, I'm having a day myself. Um, so I just wanted to alert you guys, the S SDE staff, that your team, that we've got OEC coming on at 2:45, and you all at 3:30. So you are more, you all are more than welcome to hang out in the waiting area. But if you want to, if your team wants to go off and then come back on, um, you can do that as well. All right. Did you? Okay. Laura, Laura, can I ask you a, a spray question? No, she's trying to function. <laughs> I know that. I see that. Oh, wow. Doug's coming on? Oh. 
this meeting is somehow playing twice on my computer. So I need to get out of it um, and then try and get back in again. I don't know what is happening here, but I keep hearing the same things over and over again. Hello? Can, can you guys hear me? We can hear you, Doug. I, I, I'm in the middle of this hearing. I'm not letting go. I, I will get my the work that I need to do on the appropriation side done. But right now I'm in the middle of this and I cannot let it go. What I will tell you, though, over my 10000 event, I'm putting all the money back in for our charter schools. I'm, 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 I'm requesting that we put our money back in our charter schools, the million dollars that we have put in before to start. You will get my information, trust and believe. Right now, just in the middle of this meeting, I know this is the only meeting we have, but my reports or my recommendations will be coming coming soon. That's okay, Doc. Thank, thank you. Thank, thanks, Doc. Yeah, yeah bye-bye. Bye. Bye. <laughs> It's a public service announcement. <laughs> first, 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 we had YouTube Live issues, and now we're just saying it all on YouTube Live. So <laughs> he's, he's on fire over there. Yep. Yes, he is. Yes, he is. <laughs> oh god! We got ten minutes before we start. Yeah, no, let's yeah. start now. <laughs> we can't start without the people, so. Yeah. I'm going to go get a cup of tea. Okay, go get a cup of tea. Thank you. Slowly but surely, the OEC folks are coming on, but Commissioner Bai hasn't come on yet, so. Okay. Hello. There's Maggie. Hi, Hi Maggie. Maggie. She will be coming on soon. Okay. And if she doesn't, I will find her. I promise. <laughs> How is everybody? Tired. It's been a week. Yes, it has. Yes, it has. One day we'll have to do a meeting where everybody puts their pets in their picture, like Taylor. That's uh, that's gonna be our replacement because we can't have people going through the uh, the walkway between the LOB and the Capitol. <laughs> I think we usually do that in March, don't we? I hope we get to do it again. I didn't yeah. get to participate the first couple of times. Yeah, it was fun. One here. Just remember you're on YouTube Live. <laughs> I I try to remember. I don't always, but I try. We do all right. I couldn't imagine if like town council meetings were on YouTube live. They get a lot more views. I tell you that. That wouldn't be such a bad thing. <laughs> All right, Kathy, what kind of potato chips you got? <laughs> That's what I was going to tell Tony. I heard if you eat a bag of these little potato chips, it has far less calories. But if, if I eat them one small bag at a time, it's not the same as eating one whole big bag. <laughs> <laughs> And that, ladies and gentlemen, is our health lesson for the week. <laughs> a commissioner. 
<laughs> oh my goodness. I thought I was on time, but you guys are ahead of schedule. This never happens. <laughs> Hi, everybody. CRB was fast and efficient. All right. I'll be, I'll try to do the same. Hi, Representative. Great. We have a couple of minutes. I'm just going to go downstairs because I printed out your stuff. Okay. Hi, Beth. Hi, how Representative. How are you, Tony? Hi, I'm Tony. fine. How are you? Good Tony, did you. you see what I got today for going Wait. out? Your it's maple a, syrup? It's your a maple, maple syrup. syrup. It's um from, and then the Lieutenant Governor um, tapped into a tree out there. So we have trees outside. We do. We can tap, tap our own maple syrup. Yep. Hmm. Okay. I'm just letting you know I had a sapsicle in my yard, and um, it it was not going to make enough for anything but a tiny little pancake, maybe about this big. Okay, so when the revolution comes, we can go get maple syrup on the Capitol grounds. <laughs> <laughs> that used to seem like a far off joke. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I know. I'm telling you, I'm drawing the line at that. I'll do just about anything for y'all, but I ain't tapping trees. <laughs> oh. Mr. Chair, come back. Yes. There we go. All right. You want to get started? Absolutely. Commissioner, welcome and your team. Thank you. Happy to be here. Yes, I see we have, I think, nine questions in front of us. Okay. We'll go over them one by one. Sure. Uh, first, was the information you provided relevant to the discussion about birth to three providers? Um, yes. Now, I don't, I don't think you want me to read this, correct? I, I mean, no, I, no, I, no. I, we're going to go straight into questions, but I want to make great. sure. Okay. Super. Break them down one by one with these nine these nine points we made. Uh, Got it. In our last discussion. Um, so I guess I'll go first. Um, one of your short term needs is increasing the general administrative payment from a hundred dollars to two hundred dollars uh, per child. About how many children would that serve, and how much would that cost overall? Well. First of all, I just I just want to be clear that what we've presented is this is what the providers are saying they needed. Okay. Um, you know what I mean? This is not and and we take those requests very seriously. It would cost um, six hundred and twenty nine thousand dollars to do a one time gap payment. Um, and so so there's that. And then. The other was a temporary increase in gas pay and gap payments to two hundred dollars. The cost of that would be five million dollars for a fiscal year. So these were requests from the birth to three providers, and I can ask Nicole from my team. Um, Nicole, do you have any anything to add to that? The only thing that I would add is it's really hard to say how many children that really um, impacts because it needs to be a child with an IFSP written for less than nine hours per month. So we can certainly get you averages of what it's been for the last couple of months, but it will vary from month to month. And Nicole, will you just introduce yourself for the record? Yes, I'm sorry. I'm Nicole Cassette and I'm the Part C coordinator for Connecticut. Um, and um, Nicole, how many children currently in uh, birth to three was another question of representatives as well. 6,075 had IFSPs on two one, I believe. And I will double check that number, but it was around 6,000. I think that's a good enough estimate, 6,000. So you said 6,200, I'm, I'm sorry? 6,075, I believe it was for two one IFSP count. Okay, okay, thank you. Okay. Any, any other questions uh, from the committee pertaining to birth to three? Senator Austin, I see you. Thank you. Um, so it says here, um, the, so we got the one-time payment 
um, to programs. We've got, what is the 10% uh, rate increase on an interim basis relative to? Um, I'm gonna ask Nicole to, to speak to that. Thank you. Absolutely. So that is the provider's request. So they're requesting that the Medicaid rate is increased by 10%. And would Medicaid do that? Would they approve that? If we, we could petition to ask. It would be a request. It would have to be a request of Medicaid. And have other states done that? I'm not that sure about can... other states. Nicole, I don't know if you know. Um. I'm unsure. I can look into that and ask my colleagues. That, that would be great. And then the other one was revi revise the regulations to provide predictable rate increases and revise the funding streams. Um, so I'm, I'm curious, what are we looking to do here? Um, is, uh, would this be to uh, put in statute um, a uh, automatic rate increase year over year? I believe that's what the providers were asking for. Again, you know, these answers are are sort of their requests, and right. um, I think our providers do a do a super job. So I'm I'm just saying this was not part of our budget, but but the question was, you know, what are sort of what is needed, and this is what the providers have said they need. And what do you think they need best? Well, I, I do think this sense of um, predictability is always important. For nonprofits, and I know you know, and and when I ran a nonprofit, you know, you'd have costs going up and um, rates staying the exact same, and over time, it it can impact the quality of the program. So, um, Mr. Chair, if I could ask one more question, um, the uh, early childhood area is something that we all noticed in the budget does not seem to have a lot of increases in it. Mm -hmm. And really curious as to why early childcare did not get any increases in the governor's budget. Yeah, I appreciate that question um, because um, as you know, throughout the pandemic, the governor was recognizes how important early childhood is. And I believe, and I know he does, I've talked to him within the hour for the long run, know how important early childhood education is. Um, we have been waiting for what is coming out of Washington. You know, there was a proposal that would have brought $200 million in this current year to Connecticut um, to plan and use uh, to expand childcare. Now, um, it's still not clear what's coming from Washington, but that's why we're going to have to work with you all to make sure that any state resources um, that the legislature and OPM and the governor work on and negotiate will work along with those federal dollars. Um, but there are complicated rules about supplanting, et cetera. And, you know, the governor wants to be cautious with, with state dollars and um, to maximize federal dollars. And uh, I, I think some of the calculus changes if in two weeks, uh, there's still no sign that DC is going to be funding early childhood, I think for both OEC and the governor and for the legislature, because um, I've been out in the field the past three weeks and things are dire out there. And the governor met with a provider today. Um, and, you know, we recognize the challenges. That said, um, we have gotten 108 million out the door that help programs temporarily. We've invested about 100 million more in care for kids going from 127 million a year to anticipated in this coming fiscal year that you're budgeting for now. Care for kids will be up around 190 million. Um, so there, there is, there has been more funding put in the system because of the American Rescue Plan, and there's more going out very soon because not everyone applied for that funding. So there were some dollars left, and we'll get every dollar out to programs um, with another payment in the next few weeks. Um, but it's still not enough. Those are temporary funds. Um, so the 100 million over the next two years in care for kids helps some. The stabilization helps some. Some programs have spent it all. Some are keeping some in reserves. Um, but there needs to be this. This the, the scale of this problem requires a federal response, 
and we expect a federal response. It's just that the timing, this is going on all over the country with commissioners, the timing along with legislative sessions makes it very difficult to plan. Well, I would just have to say, say for the record um, that everybody I'm hearing from, every single legislator is saying, that we cannot wait for the federal government because if the federal government gives us nothing, then right. these people are not going to make it. And, and I so think the governor agrees. I mean, I would say, you know, in my conversations with him, uh, we agree and, and, you know, we're really ready to work with the legislature. We're listening at the hearings. We're talking to providers. He's yep. going to meet with providers. I'm meeting with providers. We agree that there is a big problem. All right. So then we need to have from you what, all due respect to the governor, he didn't put anything in the budget. Mm -hmm. So we need to hear from you what that what that response would be. So if you could get us some information relative to the, it's a percentage increase, it's a, a one-time payment for this year. What is it that they need to stabilize um, this, this uh, uh, early childhood problem? Because we can't leave and then come, you know, and then come back. We, we all know we're not coming back after we vote on this budget. We need to know what needs to be in here to stabilize early childhood. Thank you very right. much, yep. Mr. Chair. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Representative Nolan. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And that is pretty online of what I was going to talk about. Um, I know, I know, flooding. Flooding you with money is is a great thing, and it and it helps a lot when and if that can happen. But is there other things um, that are needed from legislators, uh, change of policies, or uh, things that just would make it a little bit more easier uh, to help develop uh, what's needed to to help people a little bit more? Um, I know funding is always seems to be the answer, but um, I'm, I'm thinking there's other things that we might be able to do to yeah. uh, help, even if it's streamlining some of the policies or something uh, to get people what they need. Yes, um, Representative Nolan, I really appreciate that question. And, and Representative McCarty and I just had a conversation in the Education Committee about some items um, that might make it easier for programs to sustain. Um, and there are also some regulatory items that could be managed statutorily that would help. Uh, we know that family child care is a part of this solution and uh, particularly, um, well, in some of the child care deserts across the state that exist you know, throughout the state, um, there have been zoning challenges for family child care programs. I know there's a Senate bill that's addressing that, that may be worth looking at and, and we'll see what the legislature decides. Um, we can look at the hours and the weeks that are required a year um, to see where, where we could look at some of the workforce requirements. We're happy to work with you to maybe come up with a package of items like you talk about that could help the industry sustain. Um, you know, I do think we can't overestimate how important Build Back Better was. Uh, we, we have, the survey shows the programs say they would not have been able to stay open without those dollars. So like you said, those dollars helped in the short term, but now, you know, those, as those run out, uh, providers need help in many ways. Um, so I think there are both fiscal and regulatory items that can address that. So we're happy to work with you on that. Yeah, definitely. Um, if you don't mind, when you send Senator Olson's list, if you can do like a little addendum with those things. Sure. Uh, um, then sure. we, all, we all can see it and we can yeah. try and move with that. I'm, I'm sure sooner the better. Uh, Definitely. But we can try and do something this year that will have a good impact or an impact that will even help a little bit more. Mm -hmm. um, I was in the other meeting with you and I appreciate the information that you were able to put out and your staff. Um, and we just want to thank you uh, for all that you're doing. We know that you know, it's hard, you know, but we appreciate you. Thank you, Representative. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Representative Nolan. Uh, Representative Walker. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And hey, Beth, how you doing? Uh, I'm good, how you doing? Whatever, Beth, Tony. Um, <clears throat> anyhow, 
I like that. Part. I want to continue. I want to continue um, the conversation that we had that that you were having with <clears throat> um, Senator Austin. So you got it. It says here you got a total of 189 million federal COVID relief funds. Did you get you? You also got ESSER dollars too, correct? No, those went to the State Department of Education. We did get some gear dollars that were education dollars that we used to get technology to birth to three families and providers and home visiting and, and child care. But um, we we got significant, um, we got coronavirus relief, CARES and American Rescue Plan. Okay, so, and that total to 189 million? No, it's over 300 million. That's what, um, what when, when you look at the response um, representative, Mm -hmm. um, it's, that is, those are the dollars out the door. Mm -hmm. There are many more dollars, um, in contracts in process, for example, a hundred million more in care for kids that goes out month by month, but okay. those dollars are reserved. That's how we get to 190 million from 127 million in care for kids. The governor opened that up to workforce development. That was $50 million. We opened it up to families, 50 to 60% of SMI. And we're giving a 20% bonus to programs that are accredited each month. So, you know, those will go through 23, but they're already assigned. When, when you say you give, you're giving a site when they're accredited, you give them a 20% bonus? The Care for Kids rate always had an accreditation bonus. It was 5%. And we moved that to 20% um, because mm -hmm. it, 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 it's, it's complicated, but... Um, it is a way that the money goes directly to programs, and we were concerned about holding on to those programs and, and Head Start accredited too, like Head Start has its own accreditation. Um, it's a way to work to hold on to the highest quality settings um, mm -hmm. and to, we've had a lot more programs enroll to become accredited as well because it will increase. And those dollars, um, they go right to the program, whereas if you increase, if you went from like 50% to 75% of market rate, mm -hmm. those dollars don't all go to the programs, but when you do a bonus, it's a way to get the dollars directly to the programs. It's a little complicated, but bonuses are a good way to help programs out in the short term. Um, we also, for example, gave a bonus for programs serving infants and toddlers with the stabilization funds. And we gave a bonus to high social vulnerability index communities um, because they're experiencing um, much steeper um, enrollment declines. Okay, so we have a, <clears throat> you have a, a slide that shows all the program closures for mm -hmm. the last five years. Mm -hmm. um, DCFH and DC, so I'm, I don't know those. those sure. Who, what are those? Sure. Things? So for those, um, yeah, that's the slide, folks. It says program closures SF. 15 to 21, mm -hmm. uh, the DCFH is daycare family homes, DCCC or daycare centers. And then those are totaled across. And so you can actually see how the stabilization funds just for the short term have helped, but you can also see how before that programs were already struggling. And then you took COVID and the cash has helped in the short term. Um, but I don't think that number would be, will be 220 when we look at June 21, 22. That was the idea of the American Rescue Plan dollars, that they could hold up businesses while they waited to get their business back. The difference in childcare is the business isn't bouncing back. They're having trouble getting workers. Families aren't enrolling as much, so their enrollment's down. Um, so it's not just going to bounce back like maybe the airlines will. They're, they're seeing a prolonged um, problem and, and the federal dollars are running out. What, what we sent out in many cases has already been expended by programs. So are both categories credited programs? Is that what, when you were saying back before? Oh yeah. Well, family homes can be accredited and child care centers can be accredited. Um, okay. Yeah. Okay. So, what does it mean when you say accredited? So um, for about, well, since we started school readiness, Connecticut has had this standard uh, to help, has had programs in place to help 
um, child care centers get any EYC accredited. And it's a self-study, self-improvement process where you reach certain standards. And when you reach those standards, you're, you're accredited. Mm -hmm. Sort of like, you know, it, it's along with NEASC accreditation that, that right. schools go through. Mm -hmm. um, and with family child care, it's a different system, but they have an accreditation system. And with Head Start, they have their own system as well. Um, so we accept any of those three um, accreditation levels to get an accreditation bonus. But Do they have to go back to, they have to go back to, they have to go back to school to, to get this? Uh, no, no, this is a, it's like a program level, you know, it, it says you're engaging parents, you have a curriculum that matches the age, um, you have a certain number of teachers with degrees, but they don't all need to have degrees. Okay. Um, you do a parent survey every year to, to gauge satisfaction. Um, it, it's a, it looks, they, you know, accreditors come in every five years and walk through the rooms uh, and look at the quality of the teaching. It's really saying this is meeting a quality standard. Okay, okay. So I guess the, the concern, uh, besides the fact that they don't, like the kids aren't, aren't signing up and the, the um, you can't find staff, those are the two main things that, that are affecting why they're closing. There's not any other factor that, that you, you can say is affecting the closing. Correct. I think in Connecticut, 75% of childcare programs are private businesses, right? They're small businesses. They want to make a profit. And it's been difficult to make a profit in childcare because there's this cap on what programs can charge. Look, if it was pure supply and demand, infant toddler spaces would be charging $1,000 a week. You know, it's just so hard to find in Connecticut but they can't charge a thousand dollars a week, even though there's high demand because parents can't pay a thousand dollars a week. So it's always been a business model that had that challenge of this cap that they can't really charge what it really costs to do high quality. And so that's always been a problem, but it's been exacerbated by the pandemic um, and by parents. And frankly, also, you know, there are things like changing work environments for parents. So parents might be making different choices now because they can telecommute and they don't need 50 hours of childcare a week. Maybe, you know, there's a lot more flex schedules. One parent has one day a week off, another parent has another day a week off. Um, things have changed very quickly um, with COVID. And so I, I don't know how many of you were at the education hearing, but you could hear even not as many kids have come back to school school. That's right. free. And so it's, you know, childcare is not free. And so it, we're just not seeing the comeback yet. And we just don't know representative what's gonna happen next. But we so, wanna keep the industry vi viable. Will we ever get to the point where we will pay for preschool um, at the same level that we pay for K-14 school? Well, the um, Build Back Better had was designed that it would have common standards with the public schools, both for, you know, quality and teacher pay, et cetera. Mm -hmm. um, that, you know, that was a $450 billion proposal um, that's, that's not out there right this minute. We don't know where it's going to be, but so that was the goal of that. Will we in Connecticut get there? That will depend on, you know, the, the legislature, I think federal dollars and, and the leadership. Where, just my last question, where are we? <clears throat> so let's say e ECS is about $8,500. I mean, yeah, $8,500 $8, a year. How much do we pay a childcare facility for childcare? For you? Um, well, school readiness and child, and, and child daycare, which are our state funded programs, we pay about $9,000 a year, mm -hmm. um, but, when you look at ECS representative, the communities are putting in a lot too. So probably the average school spot costs 17, 18,000. I don't, I don't know what it is right now with that. When, when I was with you, that was probably what it was all in. Mm -hmm. um, Childcare is 50 weeks a year, 50 hours a week mm -hmm. and two teachers, not one in every classroom and, and, and a max of 20 children in a classroom can't be more than that. So um, when you, when you put them side by side, um, you can see why the businesses are having trouble. Right. That's what that's what I was trying to to sort of summate. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Thank you. Chair.
Oh, Mr. Chair, sorry. <laughs> Thank you, uh, Representative Walker. And I just, before we move on, I want to remind members of the committee that we're on number one and we oh, have about sorry. five minutes left. So uh, look around at your sheets and see what else you want to you wanna ask about. Uh, Representative Johnson and then Senator Austin for the second time. I uh, thank you so much. And thank you, uh, Madam Commissioner. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Just quickly to follow up on, I heard some of the education committee meeting and some of the uh, some of the discussion that Representative Walker was uh, discussing with respect to early childhood opportunities. And uh, there is there a proposal to uh, expand that so that we're going to try and make sure we maximize that in the Alliance districts. Um, I'm not sure I understand the question, Representative. Can you can you rephrase it? Just sure. I don't know exactly what part of the proposal you're talking about. Uh, early childhood, so that uh, uh, birth uh, not birth to three, but early childhood uh, children would be able to pre kindergarten would have access to um, that educational opportunity um, for free in Alliance. <laughs> oh, I I see what you're saying. Um, uh, what what we're trying to plan for is really an integrated early childhood system that both has private providers and and public schools. They're part of the system now, and I expect they'll continue to be part of the system. Um, do I see a day when there'll be public preschool and uh, available in those settings? Um, yeah, I think think that could be coming. And I think there was a big push for it federally uh, and funding federally and the state would have a share as well. Mm -hmm. um, but we're not there yet. Um, I will say that in certain parts of the state, there's much more public preschool where there tends not to be a supply of childcare that happens, you know, because 75% of it's public uh, is, is private business. Um, so, um, you know, it, it's, it's not, it would be very expensive um, but I think, you know, we know the return on investment is there, um, but it will need to be done systematically in collaboration with the governor of the legislature, I think, and with communities uh, hearing what community needs are. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for that. And I look forward to working on that. And it seems to me to be something that I'm really hopeful that we'll be able to push forward. And I think it'll really help uh, the, the schools when the children come in more prepared uh, for the next next thing for the pre-K, for the, I mean, kindergarten and then regular, uh, regular K through 12. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Uh, Senator Austin for the second time. I have only one question. Can you provide a map that shows where all the childcare centers and family childcare homes are? Oh yeah, uh, we've we got have, that. Mm -hmm. We have the one that uh, that talks about the closures. So if we could have yeah. one that shows where they are, that would be great. Thank you. Absolutely. All right. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, Representative McCarty. Yes, thank you very quickly. And uh, it's good to see you again, Commissioner, today. I know, and I, I think I'm just going back a little to Senator Austin's comments. If you could maybe give us a time frame. I am too worried if the federal dollars don't come through, what we will do. And I, I have complete faith and confidence in your uh, leadership, but I think we need to get a plan as soon as we're we're able to get one in place just in the event that those uh, federal dollars are not there. And I, I would, with this opportunity, just the, um, the continuous work with the women's councils, the uh, small business, I think that's very helpful in our districts with the, the grants that they're also supplying. Maybe we could like coordinate a little bit with what they're doing to see how many more slots we might uh, be able to fill going forward. Thank yeah, you, Commissioner. Happy, happy to work with you on that, and and I'll be I'll work with OPM and the Office of the Governor and the Legislature to to come up with what you're sort of referring to as like a backup plan. What do we do? Yeah. Thank Thank you very much. Thank you, Representative McCarty. Um, coming off of that, when we're talking about ARPA funds, I know uh, in your in your packet that you gave us, you talk about how it is not favorable or sustainable to use these funds for uh, birth to three. However, I know in other, in other committees and in other instances, we are implementing things when federal funds sunset. If there was some security in that way uh, for us to deal with an issue that you have, when, it, when this sunsets, would that 
make it more favorable for you to use these funds, meaning you'll know there's not a cliff that you're facing. So you'll be able to use it for operational costs rather than uh, one time uses that you usually use it for. Now, I know in the next uh, question that we had, there's $18 million unobligated. And it seems like that could go a long way towards uh, some of the issues that we see in birth to three. But I know you need that security going forward. Yeah. Thank you, Representative. I just want to be clear. We did we did try to see if any of the child care ARPA dollars were usable for home visiting or birth to three, but they're very it, they're very clear that those need to be used for child care. So the and and a lot of that is is a care for kids buffer where, you know, like you're saying, we don't want to have a cliff at the end of of this where there's you know seventy five million dollars in care for kids right now that is through September of 2023, I believe. Um, so we're sort of we're sort of looking at those dollars for child care. And unfortunately, birth to three and home visiting did not get near the kind of attention that child care did in federal funding. But we are trying to use those funds as they were intended just for some of the purposes you're talking about, some of those long-term issues to use them to set us up to be ready for the long run. Okay, thank you. I appreciate that. Um, moving on, I'm gonna skip over number two, if I can. Uh, that's pretty self-explanatory. We all have that in our emails. Um, of the childcare facilities that have closed, um, we spoke about, uh, in your presentation, it's about a difference of uh, 43, uh, family child care homes that have that have closed overall, meaning ones that have closed and not reopened. Um, you, there's one more group family child care home and 97 child care centers. Can can you uh, explain for me and and probably most of the people watching at home what the difference between a family child care home and a group family child care home is? Yes, and this is this goes to Representative Nolan's question in a way. Um, so a family child care home can take um, up to nine children, six a full day, and then up to three after school currently. A group family home um, can take up to 12 children. And a lot of times someone has a small business that's a family child care home, and they want to take the next step and make a group home with 12 children. Um, but the zoning and regulatory rules in Connecticut make that very hard. So in New York, uh, there are 2000 family group homes. And in Connecticut, we have like 13. That just gives you an indication. I know New York's much bigger, but it gives you an indication of the barriers, like the kind that are gonna be addressed in Senate Bill 291. Um, that, you know, I met, with, I met with about, I don't know, there were 15 family childcare providers and probably a quarter of them wanted to be a group home which creates capacity and in some ways is a more sustainable business model because you just have two staff, you're using existing space. You know what I mean? You don't need a whole center. Um, they can sprout up in neighborhoods that often are childcare deserts because it can be at somebody's home. Um, so that, that model is like a small, small program, whereas a center has to meet all kinds of building and zoning regulations, sprinkler systems, um, you know, a different level of fire code. Um, and, and obviously in every case, we want them to be safe, but um, the group homes are, there are almost none in Connecticut, uh, even though there's definite interest. So I do see this as something, as another way to Representative Nolan's point that we could look at the regulatory structure and create more capacity in some of those um, childcare deserts. Um, and and we're, we're, we are actively working and talking. There's some lawyers at Yale Law School who are trying to look at this and help us think through it because you know, Representative McCarty asked for a plan. We're definitely thinking about this and planning and trying to find ways to help in this short run. Thank you. Uh, are there any other questions from the committee about closures or reopenings? Uh, Well, if not, we can move on. Um, and then there was the, the fifth question about uh, 
how much funding we need to address staffing issues and how many teachers are we short? Would you mind just expounding upon that for a second? Sure. Um, and and we will uh, we will we did get to the education committee and I'll ask my team to forward it to you all. We did do a staffing study at Representative um, Sanchez's request. Uh, it's delivered late, but it's delivered. Um, and uh, we have a staffing shortage. I, 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 I was at a program yesterday. She lost two staff in the past month who'd been with her five to 10 years because other jobs are paying so much more now. Um, so that's going on, I think, across the low wage part of our economy where they're competing for low wage workers. I'm sorry to refer to child care providers who are professionals in that way, but that's the reality of this woman dominated field. Um, so that's a, that's a real challenge and um, something we, that will be part of the bigger picture that, that we're going to have to address. Yeah, and, and in your mind, because um, I know the, the biggest issue around uh, a lot of the shortages and closures is insufficient staff. Um, is it because, you know, they're getting hired elsewhere uh, because we require a bachelor's degree for, uh, you know, a, a low paying, a low wage paying job? Uh, what do you think the barriers are there for getting more staff? Well, I think we've seen a 60% drop in the number of majors entering early childhood at our community colleges. That is alarming. Um, so we have less people coming in. Um, the wages haven't gone up as other wages have. So I, I do think it's about the wages and it's also about working conditions like anything. Um, but that that is that is, I think the primary problem is the low, the low wages. And, and do you think that it's necessary to have, uh, you know, folks who are going to provide early childhood care to get bachelor's degrees, or could we create uh, shorter, shorter term certificate programs in our universities and, and community colleges to kind of fill that same need, but not uh, have the same four year commitment that they're asking for right now? Um, well, we, we have a process and, and we have granted many waivers to the bachelor requirement, you know, during the pandemic. I, I don't think that's the issue right now, but I do think, especially, you know, I'm an early childhood provider. I have my master's degrees. I taught infants and toddlers and I needed every inch of that master's to do that. Um, but as a field, we are looking at national standards that have a one-year degree, as you're talking about, a CDA, and then an associate's, a two-year degree, and then a bachelor's. And we believe it takes a combination of these degrees uh, to form a high quality early childhood program. And um, we're part of that. We're, we're moving our system to align with the federal power to the profession. Um, and so I'll just stop there because I know you you have a lot of questions. To no, no, but, but I think uh, at least my, my point and forgive me for going down a little bit of a rabbit hole here is, you know, I'm, I'm a younger person and, and as we, as we, you know, there's a cost of tuition in college goes up. Uh, sometimes people are wondering whether it's not whether it's worth it to spend all that money on their education to not yeah. get enough back to kind of pay off their student loans or yeah. to kind of solve the issues that are are, are caused therein. Um, so it's a it's a big issue that I think needs to be solved on both sides. Uh, we need to see what that makeup is, how many people can can do uh, some of the functions of early childhood care uh, with those lesser degrees and also how to get folks paid because I know that's a that's a big issue that we're that we're yep. facing. Um, any other questions from the committee? Relative to this one issue, sir, or relative? No, to no, I think we can open it up. We have about uh, twelve minutes left. I want to make sure people get their questions in. Uh, Senator Austin. Um, thank you very much. Um, I do have one question. Uh, the reason why I was asking for the map on on um, child care. Uh, and uh, I've been bringing this up with you for a number of years now. Eastern Connecticut does not have a, 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 a well-staffed or funded um, child care uh, system. Uh, so I'm just curious, even, uh, even when I look at this, it does not seem to me that we're working towards anything to provide um, Eastern Connecticut with increased child care. And I heard from somebody, and I, and I, 
normally don't like anecdotal information, but I heard from somebody that uh, people were saying, well, we don't have to worry about electric boat. They should build their own child care center and um, uh, the workers there can afford it. But a, a beginning person working in the yard at electric boat is not um, being paid any more than a lower middle class lifestyle. Uh, we also have the two casinos that have uh, workers that are at that lower middle class level. So uh, I just want to point that out. So what is the plan? Because this doesn't tell, I, I see that you put $10 million aside. But what is that going to do? How is that being apportioned out? Um, I, I appreciate the question, uh, Senator. We, we have talked about this before and, and you are looking for results here. And I, I appreciate that. On the electric boat point, you know, the challenge with putting your eggs in the basket of corporations making their own child care is that doesn't help the whole community. The, the issue in Eastern Connecticut is a community issue and the people at Electric Boat who can pay tuition, you'd want them be, to be supporting some of the existing programs in the community and helping, helping them expand. I'm not saying, you know, we'd, we'd say it'd be a bad thing if they built one, but I think our strategy is, is more of a strategy to look at the regions that are challenged with child care and in the report that we sent over, you can see that Norwich is in the top seven areas with a shortage of childcare. Um, I don't know if I said it here at the education committee, just keep in mind that 75% of childcare is just private businesses that sprout up because there's a need. And um, that, that model is particularly challenging for rural areas where you don't have as many people. And so, I do think some of the strategies that we've talked about, um, the, the $10 million, the idea there is to help expand family child care and give grants to programs for staffing while they add children, because it's very hard to start up a situation where you're gonna need two staff when you're only taking in one or two children for one month, two months, three months while, while the need Develop. So the idea is to um, use some relief dollars to help small businesses that are family child care homes get started. And also um, to, I forget, I think it might have been Representative Johnson. Oh, no, it wasn't Representative Johnson. I can't, I can't remember. But this idea of group family child care homes where you could take 12 children. Now in Eastern Connecticut in a community, that would be a tremendous resource if you could get two or three group homes. But again, it's a challenge. There's some other challenges to that. So we're going to start by looking to expand family child care homes. And to the extent, you know, I, I did come Senator Austin and meet with the largest provider in the East, Eastern region mm -hmm. after our last meeting and said, you know, what does it take? And until the rates are higher, it's hard for programs to expand because they're losing money on every child and fundraising for every child. So both the nonprofits and the for-profit businesses need the children to be paying enough that they can pay their staff and then they can grow. And so, um, you know, that, that that's the challenge. These aren't public schools and they're not funded like public school, they're small businesses. So we are open to your ideas. We are really leaning in on family child care and I've been talking to some national experts about rural child care. Um, and those supports are available now. And um, uh, it's a family resource center out in Eastern Connecticut that's supporting the family child care homes and gonna support these expansion projects um, as they come. But, you know, I did have a good visit with um, the Eastern Connecticut provider, but the biggest issue is is rates. TVCA. And they said care for kids, staying open is very important to them. TVCCA, you're yeah. talking TVCCA. Yeah. And so, they gave us some ideas for some, you know, Representative McCarty has raised some of what they asked us to do too, to make it easier to provide care to more children. So um, I'd like to have that, um, that $10 million, how is that going to be apportioned out amongst those top 10 um, areas of uh, um, child care deserts. Well, what, what it, the, the idea is, um, that it would be an, an, we haven't, we haven't done it yet, but the idea is it would be an application process where programs that wanted to open 
would come with a plan and make an application. And as I said, we're, we're leaning in on, on family childcare because even though that's only 10% of the supply, when you look at the state, family childcare is 50% of the solution. Um, so we are leaning in there and looking to give funding for small, like structural changes that have to happen and then funding for staff so the programs can get started with the second staff person. So it will be an open process and we will wait like we, do, like we did with the, the stabilization. It will be weighted by need. And the reason we pulled those communities out was to say these are the priority communities based on the data. So we're gonna rely on the data to also assign points as programs apply for where, where the need is. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. And I would love to end on uh, this note. Can we talk a little bit about the difference between birth to three and the, uh, the home visits that we are piloting? Oh yeah, they're, they're very different. They're very different programs. So universal home visiting is a screening program. Um, it, it's, it's really a nurse home visit to connect families that have needs to existing resources but it has nothing to do with sort of the special education apparatus. Birth to three is a special education approach. It could be that a family in the universal screening got referred to birth to three, but that's very rare for a baby that knew unless it's born with Down syndrome or some obvious disability to be referred to birth to three. It's, um, they're totally different. Uh, you know, it, it's like um, the difference between having a baby and being in special education, you know, the, the birth to three is a supportive system for children with identified disabilities. Right. And I know that we were also talking about the costs associated. I do not have it in front of you, but I know it's a, a few million dollars. Can you speak to what the, you know, what, what that cost would break down into? Yeah, well, it's, it's $8 million, most of which would go to the nurses who are going out to do home visiting. Um, some of it would be program overhead. There'll be someone managing that project for us. Um, and um, so that that's just a home visiting project that's direct service, you know, the, the, and it will just be in Bridgeport at the start. And will be, um, some of it will also be evaluating the program. So, so that's, that's what I was getting at, actually, the evaluation cost. Mm -hmm. um, why does the evaluation, why is the evaluation cost so high? Um, well, the, the idea is it, it's, it's not just evaluating the program. It's, there's, we asked for a million dollars uh, in addition to that eight million. And half of that would go to evaluating how we can leverage Medicaid and other funds to sustain this program. So that's, that Medicaid gets very complicated. And that, that was really the ask of Vicki Veltri and, um, Deidre Gifford uh, to have a contractor help us identify long-term funding. The other 500 was really for Hartford and um, Norwich for planning uh, for universal home visiting in the case that we can show this is a sustainable model. Those are the two next highest need areas uh, for universal home visiting. I appreciate that answer. And, and don't worry, I don't want it to sound like, uh, like we're trying to cut it at all. I just want yeah. to make sure that we are being smart in the way that we're spending Absolutely. money. Absolutely. Uh, I appreciate dollars, it. A million dollars. We have to yeah. do our due Every diligence. Dollar. I appreciate that. Yeah. Um, anything else from the committee? Well, looks like you Look came at you up. on time representatives. Uh, you know, we, uh, we run a good committee here and, and you do a, a good job of communicating with us and answering our questions in a concise manner. We really appreciate it. Yep. Uh, and thank, just let us know if there's anything else we can provide. Uh, absolutely. As, as soon as you can get us that information, the better, because the 22nd is fast approaching. Okay. You got it. Thank okay, you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Yeah. Bye Commissioner Russell Tucker and her team are in now, I believe. Yeah, well, I want to come in. There you go. Listen, the, the earlier a day we can give you, the better. That works. <laughs> I know that you've had a, a long morning uh, on education, and I, I will have a long night going back over there. So, 
<laughs> we really appreciate you being with us. And uh, as we've done with the, the past two commissioners, uh, I'd love to just open it up to questions from the committee based on uh, what we've gotten from you. Okay. And, uh, we'll, we'll take it from there and see where this conversation takes us. All right, that's perfect. We're here and ready and able. Okay. Yes. Any questions from the committee? I'm going to actually pull up what you sent us right now uh, for myself. Just give me uh, one second, Commissioner. Sure. Thank you. I'm going to take my hand down. Okay, I'll go into a few of mine if uh, if folks aren't ready yet. One, one concern that I do have is uh, around 130, I don't remember the exact number of charter seats um, that were approved but not funded in the... Uh, in either this year or last year's budget. I was wondering what that amounted to um, and what your recommend, recommendations would be around funding those seats as uh, allocated in the budget language, but not in the funding. Yeah, thank you, Representative. And uh, in your packet, uh, I know we sent you some information that were uh, asked for the seat. So our CFO, Kathy, uh, if you could uh, unmute and just walk through that and answer for the representative's question about the seats, what was funded, what wasn't, and kind of where we are right now, I think is the question. Correct, Representative? Yes. Okay, perfect. Uh, certainly, Commissioner. Good afternoon, Representative. Um, so in your package, um, The spreadsheet that you have shows the slots that were budgeted for, I apologize, I was just bringing up the spreadsheet. Um, the slots that were budgeted for fiscal 2023 in the budget um, for both this, for um, next year. And those slots included the increase in seats for Stamford Academy um, for Charter School for Excellence, which is still uh, growing enrollment as they add additional grades. There was no change. The governor's midterm proposal does not reduce the number of seats. So the number of seats that were budgeted for by the General Assembly for fiscal 2023 are still budgeted for in the governor's midterm budget. The adjustment that the governor's budget makes, the minus $674,840, is due to an updated um, demographic data. So this is similar to the change that um, you see also in ECS. So in when you budgeted for fiscal 23, um, you budgeted a student need count that was 13,641 seat, uh, students, rather. Um, the updated student uh, need count is 13,325. So essentially that led to um, a lower per pupil grant than was uh, originally budgeted for. There was no change in the number of seats that were budgeted for. Okay, so they just replaced the ones that were not filled with, or I, I get, I get what you're saying. I'm sorry. Yeah, they're still in there. So yeah. if you budgeted for them, um, all of those seats are still in there. It's just that now that the students are weighted similarly to ECS, um, it's no longer that flat per pupil eleven thousand five hundred and twenty five dollars. So you can't just divide that number into the appropriated amount to come up with how many seats. Um, so each group of students uh, brings a different dollar amount with them based upon the demographic of that the student population in that school. So it's a little bit harder to kind of back out um, 
what's going on, but please be assured all of the seats that you budgeted for um, last session are accounted for in this number. Got it. Um, another question that I have is, uh, before we get to, to our chairs, is related to the Alliance districts. Um, I know that we replaced Groton, Norwalk, and Winchester with Plainfield, Stratford, and Enfield. I was hoping that you could elaborate on what the change in population is uh, for Alliance districts now that we've replaced uh, those municipalities with those other three. So, Representative, when you say population, you mean the aggregate student count? Yes. Um, can I, we will have to get back to you on that. I just don't have that right in front of me. That, that's fine, but I'd love to have that information uh, as Perfect. soon as possible. Yep. And, I'd, uh, and now I'd like to call on Representative Walker. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chair, and good afternoon. Uh, education folks. <laughs> Good afternoon, Commissioner, and congratulations for your renomination. It was, it's well deserved. Um, I want to continue right there with what um, Representative Felipe was asking. I'm looking at the school district designated as Alliance Districts, and you have an accountability index. Can you explain to me what is the accountability index? All right, Kathy? Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Kathy? Certainly, I will, uh, I will do my best, Representative Walker. The oh, okay. account, <laughs> okay. this is actually, um, this is calculated by our performance office. And so it is a combination of, I believe there's like 17 different metrics, which include how the students do on their, um, SBAC exams, how they do, what the local attendance looks like, discipline rates. So it's, um, it's part of our growth model where we on an annual basis provide targets to the school districts for um, growth that they should expect to see in their students' outcomes. This is part, part of our federal ESSA plan. Um, the, our accountability <laughs> index um, has been approved by the federal government as part of our plan, but it, it's a broader metric. It's not just um, students test scores. And I don't think Ajit is with us today, but. Um, okay, so so I just, there, I, it, there, there's a, a, a range of some sort because their, their numbers are like between 57.1 to, uh, I don't know what the highest is, but um, it's in the 70s. So that range are those metrics that are determined. Now, if you have a low range, is that a bad thing? Or if you have a high range, is that a bad thing? So the lower, the bottom um, 33 is what defines the Alliance districts. So uh -huh. the higher is better, the lower um, means you need additional assistance. So you're, you're still For your struggling students. and stuff like that. Uh, and Representative uh, Walker, oh, I'm sorry, I'm just gonna, uh, and, the, and the lowest of the 33 are the uh, opportunity districts. I don't, go ahead, Jesse. There, Representative Walker, there are 12 indicators um, that make up the accountability index and every district um, has an accountability index number and once you rank those in order, um, and, and, and the, the, the uh, one pager that we provided walks you through the three steps that the department goes through to determine um, who is in the, the, the bottom 33, and that becomes your alliance districts. Okay. Okay. So you, you basically coach those districts uh, in a variety of different areas in order to try and Elevate. Okay. Okay. I got There's a lot of supports. We have a, a tiered level of supports for them. Uh, when they miss their targets, there, you know, it triggers some other support. So there's a lot of supports around our alliance districts. Okay. Okay. All right. So my second question goes to you know I'm gonna go there. So SR1, SR2, <laughs> and um, what's it? ARP SR. ARP. There, there's a lot of money still out there. I, I, I hope all my colleagues look at that because there's a lot of money. And New Haven is one of them 
Representative Candelaria. I mean, um, is it, it, the wit? <laughs> I just looked at this and I was sort of flabbergasted. I I kind of knew about New Haven in one category, but I didn't know about all the other categories. And but New Haven's not by itself, so they have to they have to each one has an expiration date that's different. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay. Yes. So uh, SR1 uh, goes through 93022, and that's the one that there's most of that money drawn down. But last week, we recall we had those pie charts, but you wanted to know who still did not draw their resources down. So that those are the charts that we provided. So that was SR1. SR2 goes through 23, so September 30th of 23. Uh, so you have more that haven't drawn those resources down yet. And the one with the least amount of drawdown is the ARP ESSER that goes through 2024. 2024? Yes. 2024? You mean 920? So 930, 2024. So the districts have to obligate it by 930, 2023, but okay. the expenditures can occur all the way through 930, 2024, representative. Okay. All right. So 930-24. Okay. Um, because I, I, I mean, it's, it, 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 it's mind boggling that <clears throat> when I hear from districts that, that they, they're in desperate need, um, I think we've talked about this. So I don't want, but there, there, there are ways that they can spend them within their district. Correct. And those things can be beneficial for them in their operations. And and everybody that has been talking about HVAC systems, that can be one of the things that can be addressed in, in those fundings, correct? That is correct, Representative. And um, a large number of them are actually using, so where we see the biggest um, utilization of those funds for HVAC was when ESSER 2 and ARP ESSER came along. So um, as the funding allocations became larger, then they were able to support some of those needed improvements. But yes, there is, and I don't have the chart in front of me, maybe the commissioner does, but there is a substantial amount of money being, um, I believe it's over 200 million being dedicated to air quality improvements utilizing these federal resources. Oh, Kathy, you're correct in that uh, in that priority area, building safe and healthy schools. Uh, our districts have invested, or at least they're proposing, right, to utilize over two hundred and fifty-five million dollars across. This is across all our districts, representative. You know, some large, some small, of course, uh, yeah. and specifically for air quality. Out of that two fifty-five, one hundred and sixty-five million, again across the system, is specifically addressing air quality. Uh, improvements. Okay. All right. I did. I just. I'm. I'm. Um, I, I, yeah. Okay. My. I, I. I. Do I just do two or can I do three? Mr. Right. Chair. Two. Listen, you're. You're the boss. You got. You get one more. Oh, okay. Go I ahead. get one more because I. I get. I. I have to. I have to get off for another meeting at four. So my other one is your. Is your staffing. Okay. So. We gave you staffing last year and it didn't go where we wanted. Um, so I would like to know in what language do we have to put it in so that it is understood where, I shouldn't say that. Uh, <laughs> I, I would just like to know how we have to go about putting the, the specific areas that need help into um, positions. I'm looking at the fact that you had 27, between February 21 and February 22, you had 27 vacancies. You posted only 15 job openings, which I'm, I'm curious about, and you filled 14, but if you had approved vacancies of 27, why didn't you, why weren't you able to post jobs for the 27. Kathy or commissioner or somebody, can I answer that? <laughs> or, or a combination of both. Yeah. <laughs> no, uh, a big part of that, and, and you know, we've talked about it, uh, is the 
the challenges that we were having in moving things through the, the process represented mm -hmm. that that really is that I mentioned at the last um, at the last time we met that we've now executed an MOA uh, with BAS with their smart unit. And I can tell you, I think folks are seeing a much faster movement uh, right now in that process. Uh, and so we're just, we're, we're, we're optimistic uh, that we can be, that we can move uh, much more expeditiously on the positions that, that we have right now. Okay, I'm gonna sneak. So with the IT conversion, how badly is that? Never mind. I won't ask that question. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'll stop right there. Thank you, Representative. Thank you, Madam. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. <laughs> we have too many female chairs. I've been called Madam Chair. I don't know how many times. <laughs> <laughs> you, you've moved maybe, up to the echelons. Not, maybe not too many, but uh, Rep. <laughs> Candelaria. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, just a quick question, uh, actually two questions, but my first question is the uh, the dollars that are going for the uh, the LEAP program, it says it's targeting five additional high needs districts. Do we know which districts those are? I don't know if it was answered. If it has been, you don't have to answer it again. I've been jumping from one meeting to another. Uh, Representative, thank you. No, uh, that was not answered. And I'm not sure, we, we do this whole calculation and look at the data to figure out which five. And John, have we done that calculation yet for the additional five? No, so we've got 15. Uh, we've not gotten down to the next five yet to identify them. Is that accurate? Yep, yeah, that's accurate. So we'll, based on, based on current, the most current data, when the funds are approved, we'll identify the next five districts. And how would that be determined? What, um, what what algorithm are you using or what data would you utilize to determine what, what those five districts are? Uh, we would look at the uh, chronic absence data in those districts, the okay. number of students and percent of students who are chronically absent. We look at uh, daily attendance rates. We look at districts who have a little bit of an infrastructure in place to support uh, the work around, um, you know, the home visiting aspect of the LEAP program, which is kind of the hallmark. So a number of different indicators in that. We'd meet with those districts and see if they're ready to come on board uh, and then assign uh, a RESC to work with them uh, mm -hmm. to move forward. Got it. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for that. And my last question is bilingual education. Uh, when I look at the bilingual line item, I see that um, it's always been in funding at the same level. And we have seen that the Hispanic population in the state of Connecticut has increased drastically throughout the years. Uh, but yeah, that line item does not seem to increase either. Um, and I know we've had this conversation year after year. Has there been any thought about working with the school district to identify what is the need? Do we need to provide more bilingual educational services? And I think there is a need since a lot are migrating to the U.S. Uh, who do not speak English and they need that additional assistance. Has there been any conversation within the department? I know we've increased other line items within the budget, but that line item throughout the years has never been touched um, unless we put in crumbs. And I'm gonna say it this way, we just put in crumbs to increase it. But at the end of the day, it's the same amount, nothing has changed. So uh, can somebody respond to that, please? Commissioner, I can start if you'd like. Thank you. That's uh, it. Representative Candelaria, uh, we agree with you. Um, and part of the issue with this line being flat funded is that as the number of students that are, are identified as a bilingual increase year over year, that funding just continues to get stretched and stretched. So the per pupil decreases because every year it's been flat funded and the number of students increases. That is a significant issue as, as you rightfully called it out, sir. Um, the other thing I, 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 will, I would say here is that our director of, of equity and language, Dr. Labas has been instrumental in working with districts um, to provide additional support from the department. But the big issue here um, is that this line has been flat funded year after year, causing the per pupil amount to decrease over time, which means less opportunities for, for financial support for these students. Yeah. And that's, um, and, that's, and that's a problem, as you know, right? Um, that, that is a serious problem because there is a need. And unfortunately, is that these students are not getting the proper education that they need to succeed, right? And transition from a Spanish-speaking language and capture 
you know, the English language. So it's going to take them even longer. And a lot of them are going to fail if we don't provide the right resources. So I want to hear what does the department is thinking about addressing those issues? Because we continue, we see that there is, there, there, there is, there is an, an issue, but the issue doesn't get addressed. Um, what can we do to remedy the problem? I think the first thing um, that we, we can do is to, to do something about this issue, the, the, the flat funding that has been there for years. Um, I, I think that is the first thing. That is one of a number of steps I think we can take. Uh, another thing that we can do is to look at how we deploy our supports to districts. Um, there are a number of things that um, we have done and that we're in the process of working on, but you know, it, it, it's the onus becomes harder and harder for districts to really implement specific programs for these kids when the amount continues to have to be stretched further and further, again, right. because what we're seeing is the number of students identified continues to go up. So if, if we're talking seriously about it, we need to start with um, increasing the support um, in this line item for these students so that districts can be able to enact programs and we can provide technical assistance and support around that. But that becomes increasingly difficult to do year after year when that money just keeps getting stretched and stretched thinner and thinner. And Representative, I'll add, um, Deputy Commissioner uh, Smith, uh, Naismith mentioned our, um, our staff members here, Dr. Lavis and others who are literally working with districts and going out to districts. So to your point of assessing what the needs are, I know some of our districts have also deployed some of their federal dollars in that support area. And so basically understanding where the needs are, you are correct, those numbers are growing. We're right now at 8.8%, and I don't just like to use percentage, it means 45,000 plus of our students up from 36,000 just a year or so ago. So the numbers of our multilingual learners are growing. Uh, there's over 145 languages spoken uh, you know, from this population. So the, and it's, and it's going to continue to grow. And so we need to be prepared here at the agency in terms of the supports that we're, find, that we're providing and certainly resourcing uh, is really a, is a part of that mix as well. All right. Thank you, Commissioner. And thank you, um, for, uh, Nessie, for your answers. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you. I, I know that we spoke last year as well um, about, and I, and I will get to you in a second, Senator Austin. I don't mean to, nope. to pull off this, but uh, I think we spoke about, but I don't think we actually put into action uh, studying what this need is. And I think that's that's important as well as putting in money for it. Sure, uh, we can we can fund it uh, definitely more than we are now as it's been flat funded for, for so long. But I do think we do we need to look at what the need will be, uh, what the need has been, because I don't think that we've really looked at it in in, in such a way in a in a long time. I know that you guys have uh, your information at SDE as to what the differences are, but I think we might need to do an outright study to figure out uh, what the needs of English language learners are in the state of Connecticut, especially when it comes to places like New Haven and Bridgeport, because that's you know that if they're coming from a place like Puerto Rico, that's where they're going. So. I think that that's something we should look at as well. Um, and with that, I'll move on to Senator Austin. Um, thank you very much. And I would just like to say um, uh, to Representative Candelaria's concern to the budget, um, at some point it would be uh, um, at a recommendation from the State Department of Education that those dollars be put in. So it's not just us putting the dollars in, but should be coming from the State Department of Education that this line item needs to be increased. I just wanted to sort of say uh, that piece of it. Um, I looked at the numbers in Norwich and the numbers of Hispanic students are um, more than the number of white students and more than the number of black students. And I think that um, if we don't start recognizing the growing population, we're gonna end up with a big problem. So, um, but I just wanted to, Put that out there. So I have a couple of different questions on the charter uh, uh, schools. I agree with you that we have the number of seats that were in there from last year, but there was a, a request for an increase of charter schools across the board to have uh, an increase in seats. And that's what I'm looking for is the number of seats that those charter schools were looking for as an increase. And so I'd like to um, know um, if we increased uh, the charter school seats to that level, what would that dollar amount be? That's one of my 
questions. I don't know if anybody has. Thank you. Any. Yeah, thank you, Senator. Um, I know Kathy is now on the phone. Uh, and I know we did put a chart in here with charter growth, uh, Kathy, but do we have that information readily available? I looked at it. it just, I, I saw what you uh, talked about with uh, Representative Felipe um, saying that we didn't cut any money. And I'm not uh, talking about the weighted changes that happened. I'm talking about an actual increase in the number of students across the board. So. Right, Kathy. So uh, anyways, so, uh, I don't I don't want to tie everybody uh, up. That's what I'm looking for, because I'd like to add those seats back in uh, to the calculation. So just to say that for the record, uh, my other question is, I think Irene is on. I think I saw Irene. Is it Irene? Um, relative, hi, Irene. How are you? Um, the uh, the uh, Native American curriculum, where do we stand on that? Um, now, I, my understanding from a number of the uh, tribal nations that you have reached out to them, have you had any problems reaching all of them? What is the issue? If I may, Commissioner, um, good to see you. Uh, no, there is no issue. Uh, we have a plan um, and a timeline um, where we're going to um, we have to have an invitation go out to the tribal leaders so they can meet with us. They need to be invited. Again, we're trying to respect, as you know, and you helped inform us of the proper process and procedure. And um, again, to respect um, each tribal nation and um, to bring them together so that we can do this kickoff um, so that we can, um, so that they can then formally invite someone from their tribe to be part of our design team and share their curricular resources. So that's part of the next step. Okay, thank you. Um, because I know that there are resources available in both the two federally recognized tribes. And I'd, I'd like to make sure that we're addressing any resources that the state recognized tribes uh, may need. So if you could just keep us in mind as this is um, moving forward. Um, so uh, then I have two other questions um, relative to programs that we funded last year, both dyslexia and right to read. And um, I guess what I'm really asking for is quarterly updates from now on. Where are we? How are we dealing with this issue? Um, uh, we put a significant amount of dollars into both staffing and the programming um, for Right to Read and into staffing for the dyslexia office. So I'd like to sort of know and keep us in the loop on where we stand on, on um, uh, this issue. So, go ahead, Commissioner. I'm sorry. No, no, thank you. I'm just going to say, not a problem to do that. I know that we have um, interviews scheduled, if I'm not mistaken, at this point in time. Uh, moving forward, as we've mentioned, we want to get those uh, two leaders on board uh, so we can move forward. And not a problem in giving you an update. Uh, so you you're kept abreast of where we are with that. I see Desi unmuted his phone, so you may have something to add, Desi. We've we've gone through the process with our DAS, and so we're at the, the stage of uh, setting the interview panel and setting the interview schedule with DAS. So you don't have, right now. Neither one have been hired. Neither office head has been hired for either one of those. Would that be true? Correct. That's correct. Okay. Um, and thank you for that. And I wanted to pass along one other thing um, relative to dyslexia and autism, uh, we had a meeting with the Department of Co uh, Corrections the other day and the number of students that come into the Unified School District one are uh, being diagnosed with um, uh, dyslexia or, or autism often has not been diagnosed before. And I've asked them to give us the information relative to how many kids are coming in and being diagnosed with dyslexia or autism, but also what school systems they're coming from. Because I think that we should start holding the school systems accountable for not addressing these needs. Um, I understand special education is expensive, but we can't continue to avoid addressing the needs of dyslexia and autism and sending children uh, directly into prison to find out that they have had um, a, a special education need that that is just 
for all intents and purposes being ignored. And uh, I, I don't know what you think about that collaboration between you and the Department of Correction or what you think we should put in for policy relative to that. And that would be my last question, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Senator. Uh, certainly, uh, we, we have a growing relationship with our uh, agencies. And so I certainly want to, to speak with them uh, to get a sense of what it is from a policy perspective to your point uh, that we should be working on together. Uh, you know, my commitment to all of our students. And so if there's something not happening, uh, when it should be happening, uh, it is really good to pinpoint not only the issue, but the source of the issue, because I think it allows us to really get a closer look at what some root causes are and how even learning from that can help us to extrapolate across what we need to do broader uh, in, in the state in this particular issue. You shared a peer review article uh, with me, Senator, about this issue, uh, one that I'm, that I'm sharing also with, with our, our school district. So this is really important for us to continue to really take a closer look at. I know I'm not the only one that has talked to you about dyslexia and in particular dyslexia and autism amongst our young people who end up incarcerated. Yeah. To me, that's really a lost life. And I'd like to see us not have that. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you, Senator Austin. And before we move on from uh, Senator Austin's line of questioning, when it comes to the, the charters and when you send us the, uh, the information they're in, uh, I hope that it'll be not only uh, in comparison to the governor's recommended budget, but into what was proposed, because I understand we're already losing $674,000 or somewhere around there uh, in charter school funding for the seat for seats. And I want to know what the difference would be between uh, if, if we granted grade growth to all schools uh, from the recommended budget and also from what we've already uh, put into our budget that's uh, written now. Thank you, uh, Representative. I'm sorry, I was, uh, Kathy, I wasn't sure if you have any questions or clarification for the request. Um, oh, thank you, Commissioner. I, so I will go back and take a look at um, some of my notes from last session, but my understanding is, is that we are fully funding the seats that were requested um, in the bud, or I should say it passed in the budget last year, that we have not adjusted that. Now, I don't know if during the last session, we didn't fund every seat that was potentially asked for, um, but I'm happy to take a look and do a comparison between the two years and um, make sure you have the appropriate information. Thank you, uh, I appreciate that. And uh, now we'll go to Rep McCarty. <laughs> Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. And it's good to see you again, Commissioner. Um, I just was curious, you know, we've worked for the last three years in transitioning the tech ed schools over to an independent agency. And I'm wondering if the department could comment, will there be opportunities working with it, with the tech schools as an independent agency to still look at possibly some shared services between with the department, um, and I know there have been some transfers of positions. So I'm just wondering if there's gonna be any ongoing opportunity there to work. I know, for instance, uh, we looked at part of the delay every year. We look at world languages for one, and there was a, a gap there. And just curious about how, what, how that uh, rapport is going to be maintained with the department. Uh, thank you, Representative, and thanks for that question that allows me to say a little bit about our technical high school. We have on the call uh, Interim Superintendent Ellen, uh, Ellen Solick is here and also Board Chair Bob Trefry, and they may have a few things to add. But in your packet that we sent over also was the transition report that was submitted to the department and also uh, and, uh, approved by our state board and, and forwarded to you. Uh, and we recognize uh, July 1st is coming very quickly. Uh, and that report addressed some uh, legislative changes that were also necessary for the transition. Uh, as you may know that uh, the way that the, the organization will be separated and organized and governed uh, will be through an executive director who will be an appointee of the governor and then the executive director and a new board uh, working together will appoint uh, the superintendent. 
I'm, I am certain with all the work that we're doing that it won't be like where 71 comes in their hands off as an agency, but that there will be need for some transition uh, that takes place. Uh, in that packet that we sent you was also, I know the district looked at any staffing that may also be necessary uh, for the transition to be, be effective. So uh, I'm, I know that there'll be some working relationship uh, together, but there will be a, an executive director and, and there'll be a superintendent. And I know the goal there will be to make the system even more robust uh, and effective uh, than it already is right now. I wonder if um, Superintendent Solik, or I know Bob Trafari turned his camera on, if you wanted to say just a little bit more about this transition and really what you're asking for representative is how we continue to work together uh, in the best interest of, of, all our, of all our kids. Thank you so much, Commissioner. Um, good afternoon, Representative McCartney and, and uh, everyone in today's session. Uh, I'm pleased just to take a few minutes to um, add to the Commissioner's comments. And I'll start first by saying that as interim superintendent, and I'm sure um, the board chairman, Mr. Trefry, will concur that we continue to work very closely with the commissioner and with all of the members of the State Department of Education in this transition, because we all recognize it's a team effort and it, it can't be as successful as it should be without that team effort. So um, that is an ongoing uh, endeavor and, and we will continue to work together even after the, the uh, separation occurs. But I did wanna highlight just in more specific response to your question, there are actually some specific positions that CTEX has requested as part of the transition that will actually come to us from the State Department of Education um, in the form of uh, HR partners, some of whom have already joined us through the SMART group and also through a, three affirmative action positions that will be coming directly from the State Department of Education. And we're very appreciative of that uh, going forward. In addition to that, in the report that was presented to the State Board on February 2nd, actually page four of the report highlights uh, a number of additional positions that we will be requesting and in need of as part of the transition, including, as the commissioner mentioned, the executive director and his or her ancillary support staff, legal department positions, labor relations, um, fiscal department positions and internal office positions, uh, audit positions. Those positions were recommended directly through Kathy Dempsey's office as part of the State Department of Education in recognition that we need to remain very accountable um, as a school district going forward. So we have requested it. That's actually a total of 13 positions um, at a total figure of $941,328. And as I mentioned earlier, three of those positions are coming directly from the State Department of Education. So thank you for your question. I hope that that provides the information that you were uh, looking for. Yes, if I may, um, I do, and I, I, I appreciate your response, but I think another piece of the question, while there are being positions transferred from the Department of Education, and I'm, I think you answered it, uh, that there will be some ongoing relationships because you may find something that you may be able to share with the Department of Ed. And I'm just looking similar to what we ask of our districts to look at some efficiencies or shared uh, resources going forward as, as you get off and uh, the independent agency works that will keep that long uh relate that good relationship going between the department. So you may find areas that we can we can work together as we go forward. Absolutely, if I, if I might. Yes. Um, directly with the State Department of Education's Human Resources um, Collaborative this afternoon, we're actually in process of organizing a, a team meeting next week in one of our school buildings. And the State Department's personnel have been very helpful uh, to us in garnering um, some uh, translators and translation um, equipment, software, so that we can conduct a meeting on Monday with people at the table who actually speak three different languages. And that would not be possible without the support of the State Department of Ed and, uh, and the HR department. So I know exactly 
what you're asking, which is, will we continue to collaborate in the best interest of students' needs going forward? And, and I can answer unequivocally, yes, absolutely. Wonderful. Thank you very much. Thank sure. you. Representative McCarthy, I just add a couple of things. One is that uh, it's like the parent letting the child go a little bit, and the parent never goes away. Uh, you know, there's still the, a strong relationship with the department. And as I've said to our board and to the State Board of Education, that all of these students that are in the technical high schools are still under the purview of the State Department of Education. You know, there's still students in this state and uh, we need to make sure that we're operating in the guidelines that are set forth by the department. Appreciate that. Thank you very much. You all set, Rep. McCarty? Okay. Uh, just to expound upon the three affirmative action positions for a second. Uh, I know that in the packet that you sent us, it was spoken about how they were used for both uh, CTEC, SDE, and, and I believe also OEC. Um, but I don't think the intent of those positions was to be used in, in those three departments in that way. I think it was to give you the amount of support uh, that this legislature felt was necessary to kind of achieve, uh, I guess what we felt was the, the equity in those positions. And I think um, I would like to know your position, your position on us, not only moving those positions, but maybe adding extra positions that do the same thing so they can focus on your department as they may have been originally intended. So uh, thank you, Representative. So the, the three affirmative, the reason we gave you all the kind of the detail and the background on that piece, uh, our state agencies uh, are required. We, we do have affirmative action uh, EEO officers, uh, and that was the, op the, the office that was doing that. Uh, you're correct that it initially wasn't meant to serve all the additional agencies, but over time as, as that occur, um, that, and the, you know, I keep reminding folks, the technical high school is a large school system uh, and the affirmative action staff are supporting that as well with us and, and others. And so while you know, we, we look at the staffing that we need uh, right now, we our um, MOA with DAS is, is going to provide us with the affirmative action uh, support for a small agency uh, that they're doing with other state agencies uh, at this point. So we're we are getting that up and running. Actually, it's just starting just to see what that would, would certainly look like for us. But their goal is really internal focus to the agency, uh, you know, in terms of how we're doing everything, right? Recruitment, uh, the training, support, everything that needs to happen there. Uh, the continuation, uh, continuity for the staff going to the large school system, I think is important to keep that, keep that going while we transition off to the DAS, a smart unit for that work. We'll continue to take a look to see how that's working for us uh, and to see if we certainly need additional support. I'm not one to say no to positions uh, in, in, you know, in that particular case, uh, we wanted to see how that works for that particular purpose uh, that those positions are designed for. Yeah, and to be clear, you know, we, we understand the need for CTEX to have uh, this support in these positions. We just, I, at least I personally feel that the, there should be the same support for your, uh, your department individually, as well as maybe OEC if they needed the same. Um, we just want to make sure we're not stretching folks thin and we're really giving you all that you need to be successful because you guys have, have done uh, some really good work. You've been terrific to work with. We want to make sure that we are continuing to support that. And with that, I will move on to Senator Austin. Just one quick question for the technical schools. I know that you had one technical school that had a Native American mascot. And I uh, know that that has uh, been in the process of being removed and replaced. Uh, have you completed that process yet? Um, with the commissioner's uh, permission, I'd be happy to respond to that. Go right ahead. Uh, thank you. Um, Senator Austin, you and I had the, the privilege of speaking earlier this year um, regarding Wilcox Tech in Meriden, Connecticut. And in fact, I'm so glad you asked the question because I, I was uh, hoping for an opportunity to 
in fact, fill in the blank for you. The community of Meriden came out and the school community at Wilcox came out and spent <clears throat> a number of meetings discussing what they thought would be the best school mascot. And they in fact did settle on the school mascot unanimously uh, in shortly after we spoke actually in um, right around the holidays. And uh, so that is not only accomplished, but the community was a great, had a great deal to do with it. And, and there's a tremendous amount of buy-in on the need to change the mascot and the new selection of the mascot. So yes, that was a, uh, a successful story at, at, at conclusion. So what is the new mascot's name? I believe they are now the Wilcox Wildcats. Woohoo! very good. Thank, thank you very much. I really appreciate that. And, and the Native American communities uh, um, who uh, I wrote to before I ever talked about removing mascots and they were, uh, very much in favor of removing these. Uh, I took their um, lead. Uh, so I, I uh, really appreciate that. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And I think uh, we're reaching the end of our time, but does anybody else in the committee have a question? Well, I would, I would like to say thank you uh, to all of you at SDE, but uh, Commissioner Russell Tucker, I want to, for the record, uh, congratulate you for being reapproved. I know the other day, uh, Representative Walker and myself were stuck downstairs. We did not know that you were coming up and we definitely wanted to uh, say something officially about how well it's been to work with you, how much we've really enjoyed the experience and how much you've brought to the table since we uh, lost uh, Commissioner Cardona to our folks down in DC. But we really appreciate working with you and I'm, I'm glad that we'll continue to do so. Representative, thank you so very much. Uh, certainly appreciate it. And, and also appreciate uh, your support and, and others here for what we need at the agency. Uh, there's a lot of work to do, as you know, and we endeavor to do that on behalf of all those students and staff and working together uh, with you all. Our policymakers are a key part of the work when we think about moving education forward in the state. So we certainly appreciate it. And on behalf of the team here and those that you don't see, uh, thank you very much. Oh, thank you. You guys have a, a good rest of your day. Oh, Representative Reyes. I think I think Representative Reyes wants to uh, say something as well. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Just wanted to uh, compliment uh, our new, com our re-elected, uh, reappointed commissioner. Uh, uh, similar to uh, uh, many folks uh, in a short session, we're going in various different directions, and it was certainly great to be in the building. So it has its upside and its downside. And its downside is the many huddles that we had. And we too were away from the chamber uh, and unable to speak on your reconfirmation. And just wanted to let you know that we appreciate your service, your work, and, and most of all your passion and dedication to our kids in the great state of Connecticut. So thank you to your team and thank you for your service. Thank you very much, Representative. And now I'm gonna call on Rep McCarty to to most likely uh, round out this uh, <laughs> praise fest for, for the good commissioner. Yes, you have that right, Representative. <laughs> Thank you. I too wanted to add my uh, voice to congratulating the commissioner and just to let everyone know how accessible you are and timely and giving comprehensive uh, answers to our questions. It's really greatly appreciated. And then also to recognize you for your true interest in helping all of our students currently and formally with uh, what we have experienced with the pandemic, with the mental health services that are needed and all of the work that's going on around social emotional learning. You're a true leader, not only in the state, but in the nation in that regard. And I wanted to put that out. So congratulations to you. Thank you, Representative McCarty. All right, well, it seems like we're at the end. Uh, we, we really appreciate uh, speaking with you and I'm sure We'll have a, a few more things to tackle in the next 18 days before we get to our recommendations. So, Thank you. Enjoy the weekend. Stay well. For the weekend as well. Yeah, bye.